morning, once again, Boker Tov, as we would say in Hebrew, Bokim um, Abayim, which means welcome. Those of you guys who are going to watch online um, and have never heard of Purim, either because you have not read the whole Bible through, or you've forgotten what you read, <laughs> right? If you read the whole Bible, Purim is going to, you, it's going to stick out because that's a strange term. Purim, what's that? Um, or you've read it and you know Purim, but you're saying, oh, that's just a Jewish holiday. Why do I care? Well, um, over the last couple of years, I've been looking at some of these um, festivals. Yeah, so as we've been looking at some of these festivals that are not mentioned in the Torah, for example, Hanukkah and Purim, um, I've, I've noticed something that I had not in the past, which is if the events that led up to these festivals, which are not in the Torah, in the first five books, if those events did not happen, then there would not be a Jewish remnant. If there is no Jewish remnant leading up to the time of Messiah coming, there is no earthly vessel for him to occupy, to take residence in. And so that is the connection to all of us, right? If you want to see a personal connection, there is a connection. If Purim didn't happen, if Hanukkah did not happen, the Messiah cannot be born in the house of David because there is no house of David. There is no tribe of Judah. There is nobody actually, no tribe. So this is personal. Um, and that's why everything that happens to the Jewish people and you know, especially the stuff that's recorded in the Bible, absolutely is connected to us. If you've never seen it before, I just gave you an example. So we're going to be studying the book of Esther and uh, the Hebrew or the Jewish people typically refer to, as, refer to this book as Megillat Esther. Megillah means scroll. And there are five books that are listed in this category of the scrolls or Megillah. Um, and they are the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon, uh, Lamentations, Ruth, Ecclesiastes, and Esther. So these are the five Megillahs or Megillot in plural. So our focus is going to be on Megillat Esther. And as uh, most of you know, the two books in the Bible which do not mention God at all of those two books, one of them is Esther. And the other book is Song of Songs. Even though God is not explicitly mentioned, if you read the book, it is obvious that God is working and operating behind the scenes. There's no question. So in a sense, God is hidden in, these, in this book. And it's interesting that the name of the book, Esther, which is named after the queen, is actually related to the word nistar in Hebrew, which means hidden or concealed. I'll say it one more time. Esther's name is related to the Hebrew word nistar, which means hidden or concealed. And clearly God is not explicitly mentioned, so God is kind of hidden but he is there. And so it's a very interesting title for the book and name for this young girl who become, becomes the queen and who is the instrument of God to bring about salvation and deliverance along with Mordecai. But her name is also related to hidden. And we'll get, get into how exactly is Esther hidden. We'll get, get to that uh, as we get to the study. So I just wanted to say that up front. Esther, the whole book has a hidden aspect to it. And in fact, the rabbis say this, this is one of the books which is going to tell us things of the future because something is hidden in here which is going to tell us about things that are yet to happen. And again, before we get into the book, I want to mention one other thing or ask this question. Did Yeshua celebrate Purim? What, what would be your guess? 
in the audience. What do you think? <laughs> Did Yeshua celebrate or observe Purim? <clears throat> That's the question. <clears throat> so uh, if you read the New Covenant writings, there is no explicit mention of Purim. But you'll remember that for Hanukkah, right? We made the connection that in John chapter 10, it talks about the feast of dedication and dedication in Hebrew is Hanukkah. So he did observe Hanukkah, a festival that's not mentioned in the Torah, right? But was instituted during the time of the Maccabees. He observed, he was at the temple during that time. So was he also observing this? And we just don't see an explicit mention like Hanukkah, you know, the, the word Hanukkah is not used, but the Greek word for dedication was, is used in the New Testament, John 10. So I'm leaning towards uh, saying that he did. First off, how could he not be doing, how could he not be involved in the stuff that all of the people are involved in, right? The whole nation is asked to celebrate Purim. I mean, that was instituted in the book of Esther, right? From now on, all our generations, we will celebrate Purim um, in commemoration of the great deliverance God has brought for us. Why would Yeshua say, oh, I'm not celebrating this one? Um, but that's not, that's not a proof. That's just a question, a leading question. But in John chapter 5, it says, after this, this is John chapter 5, verse 1, after this, there was a Jewish feast, not named. And Yeshua went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, there is a pool by the sheep gate called Bethesda in Aramaic, which has five porches. In these, a crowd of invalids was lying around, blind, lame, disabled. Now a certain man had been invalid for 38 years, seeing him lying there and knowing he had been there. He had been that way a long time. Yeshua said to him, do you want to get well? The invalid said, yes, but I have nobody to put me into the pool of into the pool when the water is stirred up. When I'm trying to get in, somebody else steps down before me. Yeshua tells him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And you all know that we all, we all know that story, right? But the opening verse was, after this, there was a Jewish feast, okay? Not named. And so this, this man, invalid, basically Yeshua tells him, pick up your mat and walk. What does he do? In verse 9, immediately the man was healed. He took up his mat and started walking around. And the end of verse 9 is, now that day was Shabbat. Okay. So scholars have debated whether this feast was Passover, Purim, or Sukkot or Pentecost, um, but there's one interesting side information for this unnamed feast that this feast fell on a Shabbat. Um, so somebody did the research, apparently you can do these kinds of calculations, you can go back in time and figure out when did any of the feasts, right? We know all the feasts and on what day they're supposed to fall, right? When did any of the feasts going back 2000 years, approximately in the time frame when Yeshua was around, which one of them fell on a Shabbat? It turns out the Feast of Purim in the year 28 did fall on a Shabbat. So there are people who say, okay, this unnamed feast was Purim. And there are some who go, a step further and say it is unnamed because the book of Esther in which Purim is instituted, God is not named. Uh, that's just speculation, but interesting. Okay, so that's that's uh, some something for you to ruminate on as to whether Yeshua observed it or not. Even if it was not mentioned, I would personally think Yeshua observed it because all of his people are observing it. And there's no reason, there's no biblical reason for him not to. The other thing, again, before we dive into the book of Esther, I want to put in context for us is the following. Remember at the in, uh, very outset, I said, if the events that led up to Purim did not happen, then Yeshua did not have a body to be incarnated in, right? 
So you might ask, huh, how many, like where in the history, right, timeline is Esther relative to Yeshua showing up? So I will give you a quick overview of the various captivities of the Israelites. So the first one, as you know, is the Babylonian captivity under Nebuchadnezzar. So that's roughly 600 years before Yeshua. After Nebuchadnezzar, um, he exiles all of the brightest and the best, including Daniel and his friends, right? That happens during Nebuchadnezzar's time. And then comes the Persians. The Persians basically conquer Babylon. So defeats Nebuchadnezzar and all those guys. And now the Persians are in charge. So now there's the Persian captivity, and um, which starts with King Darius I of Persia. And, and basically, down through the line of all the Persian conquerors, eventually we, we get to Cyrus, who decrees that all of the exiles, which exiles, those who were exiled during the Babylonian captivity, can return, not can return, he says, you must. He sends them back and says, go rebuild the holy temple because your God spoke to me, right? This is a very strange thing, by the way, uh, which is usually you have the people of God go up to the king or their human Lord and say, oh, can you give me two weeks vacation so I can go back to my homeland and fix the walls, right? That's not what's happening here. Cyrus says, I have heard, I have seen, and I know your Lord, God is anointing me to send you, and so you shall go, right? It's an amazing thing. And so these exiles go back and build the temple that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed. So the, the second temple is being rebuilt during the Persian captivity. And this was led by Ezra and Nehemiah, right? So we're done with Babylonian, Persian. And in the middle of this Persian captivity, uh, so we talked about Darius, we talked about Cyrus, and then roughly 450 years before Yeshua shows up, there is this king, Ahasuerus, also known as Xerxes. He is the guy who is in the story of Esther. So that's 450 years before Yeshua came up, um, before Yeshua came to the scene. And then after the, just to finish the captivity timeline, after the Persians, then come the Greeks, right, with Alexander the Great. So that's 300 to about 150 years before Yeshua. And then finally, you know, after the Greeks are gone, it's the Romans, right? So about 70, um, about 70 years before Yeshua shows up, the Romans are now in charge. So those are the four main occup occupying forces of the land. But our story resides in the Persian captivity about 450 years before Yeshua shows up. So if the events that led up to Purim did not happen 450 years before Yeshua shows up, there is no, there's no Jewish people left. So that's, that's the context. Okay. Um, so now let's just dive into the book of Esther. All right. So yeah, you, you can open up your, your scrolls, your Megillah, Megillat Esther. Okay. Chapter one. All right. So the opening scene is this king that we just talked about, this Persian king, Ahasuerus, or in, uh, in Hebrew, his name is pronounced Ahasverosh, Ahasverosh. So Ahasverosh shows up in the opening chapter, and it says it is the third year of the reign of this king of Persia. And it says he ruled over a vast empire of provinces from India to Ethiopia. So my roots, as some of you know, is, is from, you know, I'm, I'm originally, my forefathers are from India. So this is the first and only mention of India in the Bible. Um, I'll take the, you know, even if it's a single mention, that's pretty good. And, and this is how I know, because this book exists, and before they, because they mentioned India, I know how to say um, India in Ivrit. And it's, it's, it doesn't sound like I-N-D, anything. It's Hodu. In fact, uh, my wife and I, we were at a wedding, uh, Orthodox Jewish uh, friend's wedding, and uh, I think mostly Israelis, and some of them asked me, you know, where are you guys from? And I said, 
hey, I'm working on my Hebrew, so I'm going to try and attempt to answer this question in Hebrew. I said, Anachnu me hodu. We are from India, that, that's what it was. Anachnu me hodu. Anyways, so India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces. That's what um, the Persian Empire, you know, Persian Empire's um, range is, you know, that swath of land. That's a lot of land. If you can, if you remember the world, you know, the map, India to Ethiopia, India, you know, Asia, right? Ethiopia is like the African continent. So that's a huge swath of land. And so let's just read uh, Esther 1, verses 1 to 5. No, now in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia or 127 provinces. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa, Susa is the capital. In the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. So there is the feast. Um, and it says, uh, the army of Persia and Media and the nobles and the, the governors of the provinces were before him while he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days. You might think many days is, <laughs> you know, maybe a, a week. This is 180 days, half a year. What is he doing? He's showing the riches of his glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness. Uh, to to uh, who is the audience? It says the governors of the provinces. What provinces? These 127 provinces. They're all in town. And so when these six months of um, uh, show of his glory is done, verse five, it says, when these days are completed, the king gave for all the people present in Susa, meaning the locals, right? Both great and small, a feast lasting for seven days. So there was the six month celebration, showing off your glory, your kingdom to all of the leaders of the world. Now there is the local celebration to all the people who are gathered in the capital city, greater or small, you know, no distinction. Everybody was welcome and everybody was served this feast. And that was for seven days. So keep this in mind that this is the first time these people from these 127 provinces are being called to Persia and um, seeing what's happening in this land and the, uh, the majesty and the power and the glory of this king and the Persian empire, right? So they've had, it's, it's like, um, uh, yeah, they're, they're seeing it up close. So they, and, they, and what are they going to do with this? They're gonna go back home and tell all their people, hey guys, this king and his empire, amazing, what a feast. And the wealth and the riches, wow, we've never seen anything like this. So what I want you to keep in mind is the report that comes back to all these provinces every time something is happening in Persia. So this is the first report brought back by the leaders. Okay? And, and this, is, this becomes relevant and you'll see why in a second. So continuing, still in chapter one. So as part of this celebration, I guess at the end of the seven week, seven day long festival, uh, what happens to guys who are just celebrating all the time? They get drunk, <laughs> they get drunk. And so when he's drunk, he says um, in verse 10, he says um, on the seventh day, so this is the smaller feast, right? For the locals on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded uh, his seven eunuchs who served in the presence of the king to bring his queen, Queen Vashti, before the king with her royal crown. Why did he want to do this? To show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, and the king basically became enraged, and his anger burned within him. Okay, so what just happened? And so now, the next thing that happens because the queen refused to show up when the king commanded her to show up. By the way, why did the king command her to show up? He wasn't just introducing his wife. Hey folks, meet my wife. This was part of his display of his glory, his power. His, oh, look at how beautiful. Another trophy 
that I have in my kingdom is, and she happens to be my queen. She doesn't come. Okay, so what happens? Verse 18, his advisors tell him, king, sir, we have a problem. It's a huge problem. Not that you are personally embarrassed, but the problem is going to cause for all of us in our homes, right? <laughs> Verse 18, this very day, the noble women of Persia and media who have seen the queen's behavior will say the same to all the king's officials and there will be contempt and wrath in plenty. <laughs> they're worried about what, what their wives are going to do to them or how they're going to be treated. So if it pleases the king, let a, a royal order go out from him. Uh, let it be written among the laws of the Persians and Medes so that it may not be repealed that Vashti is never again to come before the king. And let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed through all his kingdom, so now you have to keep in mind, whenever you read edict proclaimed through the kingdom, what is the kingdom? It is all of these 127 provinces. It's going to all these lands, and the, um, it says the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all his kingdom, for it is vast. All women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. <laughs> So if you write this and if you send this out, King, all the husbands will be respected by their wives. <laughs> this advice pleased the king and the princess and the king did as was proposed. So he sent letters. So here's a report going out, right? To all the royal provinces, to every province in, his own, in its own script, to every people in its own language. And that would make sense, right? Why every people in its own language? Because there's India, there's Ethiopia, different languages. That every Every man be master in his own household and speak according to the language of his people. So the edict was really about maintaining the status quo in the power structure that existed between a man and a woman in the, in the household. But it was by fiat, by force, by compulsion, under the threat of loss of security and provision, right? Uh, if, if you don't comply, uh, if you don't respect and honor your husband, you know, you're going to be kicked out. I mean, that was the point. Um, and I guess I'll just pause here and say, here's a message for us guys. Okay, so there is, there is the biblical design for how a uh, uh, household of God should be run, right? You can read that in Ephesians 5. Um, and so, th so there is that, which is in God's word. At the same time, I think men struggle with this. Men tend to fall on one of two extremes. One would be like Adam, the first Adam. And by that, what do I mean? The silence of Adam, right? Eve is deceived. She brings the fruit and gives it to her husband. And husband says, oh, thank you. And he eats of it. He is supposed to have corrected her. Said, honey, this, is, this, is go, this goes against what Abba clearly warned us against, right? So he said no such thing. He just took it. He received it. He blindly followed, you can say, the leadership of his wife in that situation. So that's the silence of Adam. So that's one extreme. The other extreme is doing what these guys did by force and fiat, making it happen. We need to be led by the Spirit and try to find that right place of uh, finding our biblical role in our homes without being on either of these two ends. Anyways, that, that's just a sidebar. But what just happened, back, back to Persia, and the king and the queen, what just happened is that there is a vacancy that is opened up, right? So you might think, this is like st ordinary stuff that we can all relate to. Okay, husband and wife, have, they have an issue, and he gets mad, and... I mean, and then he has some really bad advisors saying, okay, you should divorce her. And that's what happened. Just seemed like ordinary stuff that happens all the time. But you have to realize that this seemingly ordinary stuff is creating the room for the agent of God to come in to become the means of deliverance for his people. So everything that you and I consider ordinary and mundane 
like I got up, I had you know, took a shower, went to work, and I met my colleagues, the same people, and had this conversation, ordinary, usual stuff. But every one of them is setting in motion other things that the father has planned. There is nothing too ordinary. There's nothing that is not accounted for in God's economy. We might think, oh, this is the same thing that I did yesterday and, and the day before, and I've been doing this for 20 years, it's the same thing. In these same things, little things, the doing the laundry, the dishes, the cooking, even though it's the same thing, every single one of them, there is a new thing happening. So anyways, the king's anger abates eventually. He misses the queen. And it's clearly, he, there is no queen. So what happens? He misses the queen, and there is no queen. So what's the solution? You have to find a new queen. So Esther chapter 2. After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel under the custody of Hegai, the king's eunuch who is in charge of the women and let their cosmetics be given them and let the young women who pleases the, let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Rashti. This pleased the king and he did so. So now the search is on, the search committee, so to speak, and the young virgins um, are brought in and there's a preparation for them. All of that's happening. So enter Esther and Mordechai because she is one of the young virgins in the land who was uh, picked out and brought to the palace for this uh, selection process to find the new queen. So Esther chapter two, verse five. Now there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordechai, son of Yair or Jer in English, I guess, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjamite uh, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with King Jeconiah of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Adassa. That is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. Okay, so we realize now Esther is not really Esther. She wasn't born Esther, was she? She was born Adassa. And now you can begin to see why Esther's name actually means hidden. So if you saw this woman, the young maiden, what you see is not what is the reality. The reality is hidden. She is a Jew. Nobody knows she's a Jew. She's, her name is Hadassah, not Esther. So she is, there are a lot of things personally about her that are hidden, that are cryptic, that are veiled. And the other thing is, she is technically Mordecai's cousin. And when her parents die, he adopts her as his own daughter, and he is raising her. So uh, that's the relationship. Cousin, technically, but through legal adoption, now his daughter. And they both obviously belong to the tribe of Benjamin. And Esther chapter 2 actually gives us some more details. It doesn't simply say Mordecai is from the tribe of Benjamin. It says he's a descendant of Kish, a Benjamite. And that is significant. Because we know another descendant of Kish, who happened to be the first king of Israel, Shaul. So 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, it says, there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish. And it lists all the sons, and it, and it says, um, sorry, uh, whose name was Kish, 
And then it says in verse two, and he had a son whose name was Shaul, Saul. So the connection is both Mordecai and the first king of Israel are both not only descendants or not only from the tribe of Benjamin, they're actually from a specific line within the tribe of Benjamin. They're descendants of Kish, who is a Benjamite. So they're actually more related than just being part of the same tribe. It's also important to note, as this story unravels, to understand, this story meaning the story of uh, Esther and Purim, to understand a little more about Saul's mission, the mission that was given to him by God. Because you'll see that the mission that was given to him by God is connected to the mission that is being accomplished in the story of Esther. What do I mean by this? So what was his mission that was given to Saul? First Samuel chapter 15, verses one to three. And Samuel said to Saul, so Samuel is the prophet of God who, and who is in the business of uh, choosing um, or anointing the king that God has chosen. So Samuel goes to Saul and says, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts. It's fascinating what he's about to say. His first sentence is, oh, I, I've come to anoint you as king. And then the second sentence is verse two. The Lord of hosts, this God of Israel, Adonai Tzavahot, saying, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way they came up out of Egypt. So God is saying, I haven't forgotten this bunch of people, the Amalekites who came from behind when Israel was coming out of Egypt. And who is going to be in the back of the crowd? The young, the feeble, the, old, the elderly, the women. Amalek came from behind and they attacked them. Unprovoked. God never forgot. So God is bringing this up in his mission statement to Saul and saying, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way they came up out of Egypt. Now you, Saul, go up and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. God did not forget the evil, the wickedness of the Amalekites and what they perpetrated um, to the children of Israel, unprovoked. And God actually says, when, when this incident actually happened, right? So that would, you'll read it, in, uh, you will read the recording of that incident um, in the books of Moses, right? So if you read those um, accounts, I'll, I'll read a few of them in Deuteronomy 25, 17 to 19, Deuteronomy 25, 17 to 19, it says, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt, how he attacked you on the way you were on the way, when you were faint and weary and cut off your tail, those who were lagging behind you, and he did not fear God, meaning the Amalekites. Therefore, when the Lord your God is giving you rest from all your enemies around you, in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. God is serious about this. It's like blot out their memory from under heaven. And God says, when, don't, don't do, you don't, I'm not asking you to do this right away. You know, because you, you're coming out of Egypt. I want you to settle down in the land that I'm giving you. And when you settle down, then remember this and do this. So this is the Torah, right? Deuteronomy 25, 17 to 19. And I'll, I'll also read another portion from Exodus 17, 8 through 14, which is talking about the same thing, just to give you a sense of how serious God is about this. Um, so let me read Exodus 17, 8 through 14. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim, 
So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hand grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. It's like serious battle. While Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, so his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the, in the, years, of, in the years of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. So write it down for Joshua because Joshua is going to take the helm right from here uh, from Moses and be leading the people into the land and saying, write it down for him because I want the future generations to remember that this is what I want to do to Amalek. It, the mission has not been completed right now, right? In the Exodus account, it's not completed. There's going to be more left. And that's why when Saul comes into town, King Saul, right? When he becomes king, there are still the Amalekites. And that's why God told him in advance, Write this down, remember this, and you are to blot them out. And then when Saul is made king, God is reminding them, hey, we got to complete that mission. And you might say, wow, God seems to be mad. <laughs> he doesn't forget. And um, let me say this. When we think about God's faithfulness, what does that really mean? When you say someone is faithful to you, it means they are going to keep the promise they made to you. How can one keep the promise they made to you if they, for, if they forget the promise? You have to remember the promise. Not only do you need to remember the promise, then you need to follow through. God is remembering what the Amalekites did to his people, and he's not forgetting. On behalf of his people, he's not forgetting. And that's a good thing. This is part of God's, this is the other side of the coin, right? Yeah. Of his faithfulness. That he is going to destroy our enemies. He's going to destroy the enemies of God and the enemies of his people. So what did... Um, we're still with Saul. We haven't gotten back to Esther. Um, so what did Saul do with this mission that was given to him? So 1 Samuel 15. And Saul defeated, and Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. So Saul definitely, you know, uh, waged a campaign against the Amalekites. So, so far, so good, right? He's doing, he's, he's, Stepping into the mission that was given to him. But let's keep reading. Verse 8. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. What did God say? Wow. Everybody. No distinction. Everybody has to be blotted out. But Saul took the king of the Amalekites alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people, meaning Saul's people, they spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. This is absolute rebellion, absolute flagrant disobedience. When God said, destroy something, when God tells you and I to destroy certain things, remove certain things completely from our soul, from our life, do everything that is in your power to do so. And we say, Lord, I destroyed 90% of it. I just kept 10% just in case. Just in case what? <laughs> Sorry, that was the anger of the Lord. Not, not my personal anger. The anger of the Lord even towards me when I keep that 10%. So what did they destroy? They destroyed all that was worthless. Worthless to whom? <laughs> Fascinating. They only destroyed that they deemed worthless to them. 
In other words, they kept that they thought was useful to them. This is actually worse than I thought, right? So they're actually not following the commandments of God. They're using, they're exploiting the mission to their own gain. Oh, God said, destroy the Amalekites. So let's, do, let's go capture from them that which we can keep, right? And destroy all the other stuff which is worthless to us. So they're actually not obeying God at all. They're just abusing God. So the Lord sees this. You know, nothing is hidden from him. Verse 10, the word of the Lord came to Samuel. And he says, I regret that I've made Saul king. May the Lord never say such a thing about us. I regret that I've made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and does not perform my commandments. <laughs> that's, that's the perfect diagnosis, right? God didn't say he kept most of it except for sparing the king. He said he has not performed my commandments. God saw exactly what was going on. And Samuel said in verse 17, so Samuel is now going to confront Saul. And Samuel says, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? Ooh, that's a good word to all of us. You might think you are just a little pawn, you know, a nobody. You are, you know, you belong in this congregation, that congregation, and you're whatever it is, it's, it's not significant. God is saying, Though you are little in your own eyes, meaning you're not little in my eyes. You are little in your own eyes. That's the problem with your eyes. And he's saying back to Saul, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? So back to us. So if you're feeling small in your own eyes, first of all, it's in your own eyes. And second, God is saying, have I not made you the head over certain things? I have given you domains areas, kingdoms, spiritual kingdoms for you to rule and reign over in my name, and you're not doing it because you think, oh, poor little me, who am I? Continuing, verse 17, Samuel says, the Lord anointed you king over Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go devote to the destruction, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people, blame it on someone else, but the people took up the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, and the best of the things devoted to destruction is their fault. And by the way, they took it for the, for the sacrifice to you, God. So he's even making an excuse for them. First he blames them, and, and then he excuse, gives an excuse for them also. And then Samuel says, in verse 22, Has the Lord great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? Sorry, let me read that again. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. What is more important to God? Your sacrifices and your offerings or your obedience to him? And here's that famous line. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. And finally, the conclusion, he says, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, Saul, God has also rejected you from being king. It's a really sad story for the first king of Israel. And then Saul says to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Are we listening to people? Are we people pleasers? Or are we willing to obey God, even if that means we have to take on the wrath of those who are around us, them hating us, them rejecting us. Are we willing to obey the voice of the Lord, even if it's mean, even if it means all of that? Verse 25. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before the Lord 
And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you. For you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. Wow. And then Samuel completes the job, actually. At the end of uh, chapter 15, Samuel said, bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And then um, Samuel basically executes Agag himself. Verse 34, then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gib Gibeah of Saul, Saul. And Samuel did not see Saul again until the end of his death. But Samuel grieved, grieved over Saul. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Samuel grieves over Saul. Samuel anointed Saul, right? Um, this reminds me of the grieving of the Holy Spirit when we are disobedient. Okay, back to Esther. Why did we do all this? Uh, you know, why did we go explore Saul? Because Saul and Mordecai are both from the line of Kish, from the tribe of Benjamin. And the mission that was given to Saul was to wipe out all of the Amalekites, which he did not. And now we have Haman who shows up as the one who wants to destroy the Jewish people again. Esther chapter 3, verse 1. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the Agagite. We just finished reading about King Agag in the story of Saul. And Haman is described as the Agagite, a descendant of King Agag. So King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And this Haman is not simply a descendant of Agag. So you might ask, well, didn't Saul kill Agag? Yes. But if you read between the lines, there were people. Saul didn't just spare Agag. He spared Agag and others who were with him. And perhaps there were some left, maybe the children or the wives, right? And from them, continued the line. And now you have Haman, who shows up. Uh, about 150 years down the road in Persia to wipe out the Jewish people. And not just to wipe out the Jewish people in Persia. Remember, the edict to destroy the Jewish people goes out to, as we said before, all of the 127 provinces. That means any Jew in any land, he is going to be impacted by this edict that Haman got the king to pass. There's not going to be a single Jew left if Haman's plan comes to fruition. And who is Haman? He's an Agagite. He's an Amalekite. And uh, chapter 3, verse 10, actually says a little more than it says, Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. When I read this qualifier, the enemy of the Jews, I think of the same bunch of people who attacked Israel many hundreds of years ago, and they were coming out of Egypt. They just hate the Jews, unprovoked, no reason. And so God has, I'll just pause here and say this, and um, you know, God has unique missions assigned to each one of us. The missions are to individuals, but then there is the mission at a higher level to given to families and households. So the mission to wipe out the Amalekites was given to which household, which tribe? The tribe of Benjamin. And within the tribe of Benjamin, to the house of Kish, from whom Saul came. Saul did not complete it. Did God say, I'm, 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 I'm done with you guys. This is what I had for the house of Kish from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm going to go elsewhere. He does not. He finds another descendant of Kish and says, you will complete that which the other guy did not. Again, just God's faithfulness. He has missions that are specifically assigned to certain family lines. And that God is going to see through. Right? He's going to see to it that it comes to pass. Again, this speaks of God's faithfulness. 
So you can look back in your own generation, your own forefathers, right? Uh, and you may have heard stories about your uncles or great uncles or aunts, and you might have heard, yeah, you know, it was said that he would, he would do these great things, but in the end, he just ruined his life and he did nothing. We've heard those stories, right? And maybe the thing that we were describing, giving voice to was like the mission of God that we all sense as a family that was given to this person, but they never walked in it. God is going to bring that about to another from that same family, maybe a few generations down the road. And this is actually related to another famous line that Mordecai um, speaks to Esther when Esther is told, by Mordecai, after Esther becomes queen, hey, um, Haman just passed this law um, and we're all going to be destroyed. You need to go in uh, to the king's chamber, right? Um, your husband and let him know and plead for us. And she says, no, you, you, know, you know the rule of the land. No one can go in uninvited. That's basically a death sentence, right? So I can't go in. That's, that was her initial response. And then Mordecai says, sends a message back to her and says, if you don't do this, salvation will come from another place. Remember that line? That another place is still within the family line. If you look at the trajectory, this, this arc of the story, right? Between Saul and Mordecai. Salvation, it's like God is speaking to Saul and saying, if you don't do this, the mission that I gave you is going to be accomplished from another place. And yet that other place is going to be within the family. Because that, that was my plan. And my plans are never going to be thwarted. Yeah, so Mordecai tells Esther, right, in 414, if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. There's a cost to you if you don't obey. But God's plan is going to go go forward right it is going to come to pass and it is that same verse which also ends with that famous line and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this i think i've exceeded my usual time so we're going to just wrap up and we'll, we shall continue in the book uh, in the days in, in the weeks to come sovereign lord who is involved in the affairs of individuals because because you are the one who counts every hair on our, on our bodies. You're the one who can count. So you are intimately involved in each of us as individuals, not as a people group, as a nation, although you can keep track of those things also. Um, you are involved in each one of our lives, in the ordinary, the mundane, and you are working out your plan, your purpose, and you have a purpose in every one of those things which we think of as mundane, the ordinary things. And Lord, help us just to hear, to, to wait on you and to walk daily with you that we might hear what your mission is every day, Lord, that we might receive your mission and go forth and accomplish, Lord, that we may not grieve the Holy Spirit, that we may not grieve you and make you regret that you have made us your children. So, Lord, help us to be faithful to you. Help us to be your instruments to accomplish your plan, your purposes in this kingdom age, in the things that you have planned that need to be accomplished during this time, in this place where we live. Lord, purify us, sanctify us, cleanse us so that we can hear your voice and then we can obey. Lord, remove all of the things, all of the things that you decreed for destruction that we have stored up in our soul. The things that we have not completely let go. Holy Spirit, help us. Help us to destroy those things. Utter destruction of the things that are not good for our soul. The things that God has decreed is not good for his people. Thank you, Abba, for your faithfulness. Even when we are unfaithful, you are a faithful God. Thank you, Abba. Shua's name. Amen. We receive the blessing. Yivarechecha Adonai Vayish Marecha. Ya'er Adonai Panavelecha Vichonecha. Yisa Adonai Panavelecha. Ve'esem Lecha Shalom. 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his shalom through a sar shalom, the sure Messiah. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah.